Welcome to Southside. If you're visiting, we're grateful to have you with us here uh, as we worship the living God together. Uh, if this is your first Sunday with us, I just want to apologize because we're going to finish up almost a two-year study this morning in 1 Peter. So you, you got here for the conclusion. And as I thought about it, maybe I should apologize for those who are here for the two years that you could have just showed up for the conclusion. I like cliff notes, and so I'm with you. Well, nonetheless, we as a church have wrestled in the Word of God together, looking at words like therefore that connect the whole Bible and thoughts together. And we've been seeing connections and looking at verb tenses and word studies and context trying to understand the culture and the time and then make application to our own lives as the people of God. And the Lord has really come and he's met us in this letter from Peter and I pray that it's born fruit that will last eternally. It has been nothing but the grace of God and what he has done in this season together. So let's go to our God and Father and pray and ask him to bless our closing up of this beautiful epistle. Father, we come before you and we come through cornerstone. We come through Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. God, we thank you for the glories and the beauties of Christ. I pray that every heart here by faith is gazing into his glory and his beauty and beholding it and being transformed into his image. We thank you for the realness and the reality that our Christ is seated at your right hand in complete victory. I thank you, as we're going to learn in a few weeks, we are in Christos. We are in Christ. God, we thank you for the greatest glory and blessing that you would take sinners and join them and put them in Christ. God, we thank you that that is the fount of every blessing, and we drink and we delight and we treasure what we have found in Jesus Christ. I pray this morning now, Lord, that all of these months and years of laboring in this epistle now, that your spirit would make the final application. God, we don't want to mark up our Bibles. We want to be marked by the truth in these Bibles. And so I'm praying that you will make everyone in this room a, a, a Peter kind of person. Lord, the glories and the grace of what we've learned and seen, I pray, God, that we would be these kind of saints that people will come and ask us, what is the hope within us? Lord, we're praying that you will do that mighty work and so finish up what needs to be done in every heart here this morning. God, let them not miss what you wanna do in their lives through this word. Do that, do that final stroke through the word of God this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Turn with me to 1 Peter 5. We're gonna be looking at verses 12 through 14. Let me read those to you. Through Silvanus... Our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I've written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love, and our benediction, peace, be to you all who are in Christ. Let's take that up. Through Salvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I've written to you briefly. So who is Salvanus? The NIV translates this as, as Silas, and most of the commentators that I was studying were in agreement, thinking this is indeed Silas, who was Paul's partner in ministry. Uh, I'm not going to read all the verses, but in Acts 15, uh, 22 through 40, chapter 16, 17, and 18 of Acts as well. You can go and learn about the things that describe Silas being a part of Paul's ministry. And so this Silas is to believe to, to be that exact same one, and this is Silvanus. 2 Corinthians 1.19, Paul said this, For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but it was yes in him, Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1, and 2 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1 as well. Uh, Silvanus is described being there with Paul. So in addition, sometimes the author of a letter 
would mention the person who would deliver the letter as well, and many times they would be the first one who would explain the letters and the questions that would be read as they would take these letters and read them to the church. And so Silvanus is being pointed out as a, a faithful brother. He's, he could be the one delivering the letter as well. So it could be that Sylvain, Sylvanus was the secretary. He was the one recording and writing, and or he could be the one then who would deliver the letter to these ones who have been dispersed abroad in Turkey. And that would be why Peter would draw out that he's a faithful brother. That's how he regards him. And, and it would establish the fact, here's a faithful brother to me. He's bringing the letter and he's recorded the letter and he can answer questions. And so uh, Peter tells us, I've written to you briefly. And this briefly has been five chapters of 1 Peter. And so all of 1 Peter, here it is, I've written to you briefly, and I've been exhorting and testifying to you that this is the true grace of God. And so as I've been spending the last month praying and asking God, how do I summarize 1 Peter and all that we've learned in this letter? It's, it's been beautiful, and I just want to bring it all together as we close it out. What is the glue that holds this whole letter together? And not being able to find really the right word or phrase, uh, thank you, Peter, he did it by the Holy Spirit. A perfect summary of his whole epistle. Uh, this, what, what is this? The, the letter that I've written to you briefly for five chapters is this. This letter is the true grace of God. This is the perfect word for the summary that I was searching for. I, I was leaning towards hope. It, it, you were born again to a living hope, and we've seen that your faith is what God will use to keep you, and the thought of love throughout this epistle, and really this theme of submission to God under government and other authorities. I, I've looked at all of those, but none of them get the whole picture of this. And so I needed that word that all this letter could really climax in, and then I was leaning on cornerstone. And yet the way I see this is kind of like a, a building. And the whole building is cornerstone. It's what we learned. Everything is built on Christ. We find our meaning and purpose and existence on the cornerstone. But at the top of the whole building is this neon sign that's blinking and glorifying God, and it just says, true grace of God. True grace of God over the whole building. As we saw last time, he's the God of all grace. And so just thank you, Lord, almost two years and pull back and what Peter is, is the true grace of God. That's what we've been looking at and studying. This is the true grace of God. And so my prayer and my goal is to stick that up there this morning as what everything then in this letter has been pointing to and I want you to look at how every piece has been pointing to this great idea and theme called the true grace of our God. And so let's look at really the Picasso of God's grace this morning. But before we begin, I want to show you that there's a lot of fake Picassos out there. There's a lot of cheap copies and imitations. They're not the real thing. And that's why Peter says this is what? The true grace of God. And then you know what that tells me? That tells me that there's some teachings out there that claim to be grace that aren't really grace. They're going to say, this is grace, this is grace. And Peter's saying, no, it isn't. This is the true grace of God. And so I, I don't want a fake one. I want the true grace of God. And Peter has written briefly, exhorting and testifying to us then of the true grace of God. And again, Pulling back and looking at this letter, 35 imperatives in this letter. And there's been a letter about suffering. And it's been a, a letter telling us there's a devil who's roaring, seeking to devour and wreck your faith. And he says there's persecution that's coming upon you in this world, and there's fiery furnaces that are here and coming as well. And you just kind of pull back from all of that. And now you tell me, Peter, this is the true grace of God, you know, that doesn't feel very gracious. God's undeserved and unmerited favor. How do you treat people that are not under your favor, God? Thank you very much. Since we started this book, some of you have had to bury some loved ones. Some of you have been diagnosed with cancer. 
Some have had to live in a hospital dealing with blood disorders in your children. Some had a spouse betray you deeply. We've had some bouts with depression and loneliness. And you've, some of you have been persecuted by even your own families for your faith. And now we come and we stand at the end of this letter and we hear Peter say, this is the true grace of God. His love and his favor upon me. It doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel like the right way to close a letter. But those in this context, they've lost their homes. They're under great persecution. Can you imagine being kicked out of your home? They're, they're having trials probably to even find food and eat. They're starting all over from scratch. Fiery ordeals from Nero are coming. The society has closed in on them and they're fighting for their lives. And you just say, ah, oh, this is the true grace of God. That is where I want to bring every heart then as we close out this epistle to understand and trust and live. I want us to live under the true grace of God. I don't want to live under a false grace or a lie or a deceit. This is the true grace of God. And so the false to me would be that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It's that he doesn't discipline those he loves. That he doesn't bring what we saw in chapter five, humiliations into our lives to cut our pride down and make us humble. That isn't the true grace of God. It's just kind of a ride to glory on ease. Do you know how many American Christians believe that that is the true grace of God? I get a ride on the love boat with the true grace of God. All my sins are forgiven. I get peace, prosperity, it's mine. And at the end of, of this long, uh, prosperous life, I get heaven. And that's what's being propagated in thought. And many of us condemn the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, and suddenly we live into it, and we think that is the true grace of God. And so as we close out, I want you to hear, this is the true grace of God. Do you know what God's grace is? The favor of God, the grace of God will bring trials into your life. He will bring hardships. He will bring difficulties. He'll bring rejection and persecution from this world. He will bring fiery furnaces. Don't ever say, this isn't God's grace. This is the true grace of God. I will give you more of my presence through all of this. I will drive you to myself, purify you, strengthen your faith, and it will climax in the fullness of joy with him forever. This is the true grace grace of God? Are you spending all of your days trying to get out from under the true grace of God to the life of ease where you don't have to live by faith, that this is always going to be a time of suffering like Jesus Christ that will climax in glory, suffering in glory. What a word to summarize this whole book then, the grace of God. And so let's come and hang some truths then upon this word grace, the true grace of God and flush it out. Two years of praying over these things, saying, God, let me get this in my mind, my heart, in my life. What is the true grace of God? And I'm going to have you flip back to chapter one. <clears throat> Peter, an apostle to Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, and so the grace of God is that our citizenship is not here, and we're not going to spend all of our days focusing on our citizenship here in America. The grace of God is that my citizenship is in heaven, and now I'm an alien. I don't belong here. I think completely different and act completely different. So the true grace of God makes me an alien in this world instead of fitting in and conforming to it. The true grace of God, it's, again, it's an inclusio. In verse one, it says that you're chosen. And then as he closes the letter in chapter five, verse 13, he says to those who are chosen. And so the true grace of God is that before the foundation of the world, the God of the universe set his love upon me, not based on merit or worth, but upon his good pleasure. And so to, to never get over that I am the choice of God, this world rejects me, but I'm his choice. The grace of God is that he has chosen you. I, I pray you can never get over why God would have chosen. I wouldn't have chosen me. I'd have picked someone different. 
And the grace of God is that he chose you, believer, in Jesus Christ. And then he sprinkled you with his blood in verse 2. And when we studied that, we saw that that was really the time where Israel made a covenant of obedience to God. And the grace of God is that because of this gospel, I look at Jesus Christ and I just make a covenant. I'm going to obey you the rest of my days. You now have lordship over my life. So the true grace of God is, Lord, I, I surrender all. I'm, I'm under you as the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. That's what the true grace of God does to a heart. And then in verse three, we, we lived with, I, I said our hopes are either dying or they're dead in this world. And he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins and the grace of God caused you to be born again to a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have a living hope now. From, from no hope to now you're a people with hope. I, this morning, uh, Robert Davis asked, if the Holy Spirit was taken away, what would happen to your life? And, and Tim Stevens said, I'd have no hope. And it was just, to me, like it just arrested me. That's it. I'd have no hope. I'd go back to what it was like when I had no hope and every hope was dying. And now I've got the hope of what's gonna come and the God and the resurrection and reconciliation. The grace of God is that I've been born again now to a hope that can't die, a living hope of being made one with God. And he says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which encompasses all of who Christ was, his work and his victory. The grace of God is what Jesus Christ has come and done to reconcile everyone to, to himself, to God. An amazing grace that God himself would come and live the life we should have and die the death that we deserved. I, I pray you never get over it. I, I, I pray someone doesn't say, I'm tired of the same message. That's a living hope that you should never, ever get over the grace of God, what you've been born again to and how through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The grace of God then is he gives you an inheritance. It's imperishable, it's undefiled, and it won't fade away. The grace of God is I've got something now that nothing can take it away. There's, there's nothing as certain as this, that a, the grace of God is he will bring me into this inheritance. I have an eternal inheritance with him dwelling what Ray read in Revelation 21 forever. And the grace of God is then that he's gonna protect you by the power of God in verse five. So now he gives you this inheritance and there's a lot coming against you between now and glory. And then the, the, the grace of God is, I'm going to give you my power. My power is going to make sure that you're going to make it to this inheritance. So it isn't going to be your power, your strength that's going to get you there. It's my power, my strength will bring you to glory. Well, God, do you just kind of grab me and carry me to glory and it's just thank you very much? No, I'm going to do it, he says in verse 5, through faith. I've given you the gift of faith. And that faith is what's going to keep you holding to me to the very end. And so the grace of God is the gift of faith. And the grace of God in verses 6 through 9 is I'm going to stick you in a furnace. I'm going to put you in fiery furnaces and I'm going to boil off the impurities of your faith, the unbelief that resides in your heart right now. You need a furnace. And so the love and power of God is I'm going to stick you with my perfect wisdom and the perfect furnace for the perfect amount of time to get the perfect result of a faith that will hold to me and worship and glorify me in the day when Jesus Christ comes back. What a beautiful thing. The grace of God gives you faith and it preserves it and grows it and strengthens it and keeps it so that my faith will never die. Peter, the devil's come. He wants to sift you like wheat and destroy you, but I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Your faith will not fail by the power of God. And through that, he will use that to cause you to make it to the very end to get this inheritance. And look at verse 10. As to this salvation, then the prophets who prophesied of what? Of the grace that would come, of what we're sitting in here this morning, you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. There's the pattern, suffering to glory, 
And as it was revealed to them, they weren't serving themselves, but you in these things which have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you, how by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels are up there with epithumias longing to see and marvel at the grace of God that has been bestowed upon us. You live under the grace of God. Twelve verses of all of our foundation, the grace of God is what God has done for you in Christ. He's done everything necessary. He's eternally saved you. He's going to keep you and he's going to bring you to this inheritance. It's done. It's finished. It's by God. And so here is the gospel. This is grace. This is everything. I, my, all of my salvation then is based on what God has done in Christ. It's my faith looking to that away from anything in me. That is the true grace of God. Add one stitch of your merit and your works and you blow up all of grace. And so here it is, stand in it. The grace of God, the gospel, live in that, love it, drink it, learn it every day from every angle, stay in the gospel. And verse 13, therefore, therefore, the grace of God that is mixed up is people either say, okay, that's the grace of God. Now I can go live any way I want. And that denies a therefore. And the other is I'm going to go and I'm going to try to clean up and go to church and be a better person. And then I can have the grace of God. And that blows up. That's a false grace, both of those. The true grace of God is that Jesus has done it all. There's a salvation in him alone, and the one who believes now is regenerated, born again, made new, and you have a therefore. Your whole foundation of your Christian life flows out of the reality of what God has done in Christ. There must be a therefore in your life, or you are dead in your trespasses and sins. I've been made alive. Therefore, now show me, Peter, what's the true grace of God? How do I live as a born-again believer, new Christian? What does it look like? And this is the true grace of God, the rest of this epistle. This is what grace does in a life that's been joined to Jesus Christ. And in chapter 1, verse 13, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to fix your hope with finality on the coming to you grace of God that will come when Jesus Christ returns. The grace of God is now I've got my hope fixing on that day when grace is going to be fully manifested and revealed when Jesus Christ comes back and I will bask in it for all of eternity. And so I'm a, I'm a man who hopes not in this world. I, I don't really, I, I vote for who's president, but I don't care who's president. I care about the one who's ruling and reigning over everything and I'm waiting for that day. Come back today. Take large strides, Jesus. Come back, please. Maranatha, my hope is set on that. That's the finish line, not getting a raise or a new house. My finish line is Jesus Christ. That's the grace of God. Come, Lord Jesus. Every believer in here, the grace of God is that you're hoping. You're hoping in that final come. Quit hoping in families that get taken away from you. Health, all these things are going to get taken away. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And then the second thing in verse 14 and 15, be holy for your God is holy. That's the true grace of God. The true grace of God is I've been reconciled to a holy God. Therefore, be holy. Live separate, distinct lives for this God. That's the true grace of God. I'm tired of hearing you can live any way you want. The true grace of God is you're going to be holy because your God is holy. The true grace of God in verse 6, 17 and following is that now you're going to fear the living God and you're going to fear him because of the way that he can forgive you. And the way that he can forgive you is he didn't forgive his own son and he poured out his full wrath as he hung on a cross. And you're to look at that and you're to marvel at the way God can forgive you is that he destroyed his own son and poured out his own fury for three hours on a cross, undiluted, unbelievable. And that should cause you to fear, to reverence this God and live in fear, he says, while you walk this earth because of who your God is. <clears throat> then in verse 22... He tells us that uh, we're to thirst. For, I'm sorry, in chapter 2, verse 1, that we're to thirst for the Word of God. The true grace of God, as I thirst now 
for this word that reveals the God of all grace so that I might grow in respect to salvation. The true grace of God is I, this word reveals God and I live in it and I soak it up and I transform. This word is life to me. That's the true grace of God, how he grows faith and strengthens it and builds discernment and growth. Uh, and then fifthly, <clears throat> the true grace of God is on verse four that we come to him as to a living stone. Present tense, participle. The grace of God as I just keep coming to Christ again and again. If I could describe the Christian life, it's coming to him. And I just now, it, it isn't just I have a new set of rules and a new set of doctrines. I have an encounter with the living God. And now I keep coming to him and I find the cornerstone, everything found, its, its substance, its formation, its purpose in the cornerstone. And I just come to him. And I find everything in him. That's the grace of God, is to see the beauty of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And are you a coming one to him? Is that what you're born again to? The grace of God is I commune with the living Christ and I keep coming again and again to that beautiful one. And then look with me in 2.11. The true grace of God is beloved, I urge you then as aliens and strangers to abstain from epithumias, uh, fleshly lusts, which wage war against your soul. The true grace of God now is I fight my epithumias. I fight my over-desires, things that I love and want more than God. I resist, I fight. That's the true grace of God, not I just do them and ask forgiveness. The true grace of God here, he says, uh, abstain. Abstain from these fleshly lusts which are waging war against you. And then in verse 12, the true grace of God is keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the things in which they're slandering you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of their visitation. And that visitation was the day when they're saved. They're going to thank God for your beautiful, glorious testimony while they were persecuting you. So the grace of God is I'm going to go be different than anything else in this world. My hope is past this and people are going to say, you, you respond differently to gossip and slander and attacks and persecutions. It just seems like you hope in something beyond your own reputation, your own wants. You hope in something called living hope, Jesus Christ. That's the true grace of God. True grace, then, Peter said, is submission to God and all authority. We're, we're, we're not a people who are obnoxious, causing problems. We're a people in submission to the authorities that God has put over us, even if they're unreasonable and difficult. What a beautiful picture that will be in the middle of a, a church that is so confused right now and fighting over every issue. How beautiful will this stand out when you live the way Peter's describing the true grace of God? Humble, quiet submission to mistreatment. The true grace, uh, he gives us an example of it. Go to 221, I just wanna read that again. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So I want you to live this way, but there was an example. Jesus Christ, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. There's our example. I, I give myself to you, God. I trust you. You're going to bring justice. You'll deal with all these accusations. I just keep trusting myself to you. That's someone full of the Spirit, trusting and walking. I, just, I, trust, I trust myself to you, God. And then he says there's a power as well in Christ. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. So he's more than just an example. He's a savior. And he breaks the power of sin so that we can live to righteousness now, which is this description of what true grace is in your life. We were straying like sheep and now we've returned to the shepherd and the guardian of our souls. The true grace of God as I dwell in the good shepherd, I rest under his hand and I let him leadeth me. True grace of God, flip over to chapter four, verse two. The true grace of God is that we, Jesus suffered in, in the flesh and he ceased from sin. 
arm yourselves with the same purpose. And in verse 2, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, that the rest of your time as a believer, we don't live for the epithumias of men, but we live for the will of God. He says, you've already had time to live out all those lusts and all those desires. It's done. It's finished. And the Christian life, uh, if I could bring it to this one little phrase, is to quit living for your own lusts, but to live for the will of God. I, I, the grace of God is that now I'm done living for my own lusts. I, I did that for however many years it was when I was an unbeliever. I'm done with that. That's past. And now I live for the will of God. Is that your life every day? The grace of God. God, I just want to live for the will of God today, not my own lusts. I look to you to lead me into this or I'll bite on every epithumia that is exposed. And then in verse 7, the grace of God is that the end is at hand. We're at the end days. We're, we're closing things up. So be sober. Quit drinking up the world and taking in all of its things. Keep, keep your mind focused and your, your uh, sobriety and moderation in your life. And the reason, he says, I want you to pray. The true grace of God is you're a praying one. You're looking for grace. You're depending on grace. Everything that comes to you, you don't think, here, how can I fix it? I run to God. How can you fix this? How can you help? He says, stay fervent in the end days. Stay fervent in your love for one another. That's the true grace of God. In the end days, people are going to be lovers of self. They're going to quit loving. That's going to be the battle. And so here we are. If we're in the true grace of God, stay fervent in your love for one another. Keep stretching and going the extra mile, losing your life for one another. I just love, stretch as far as you can. That's the true grace of God. God's love stretched up to a cross on a tree. Anyone who beholds that, now you go stretch and be fervent and let love cover a multitude of sins, he says. He says, be hospitable. The true grace of God is you start breaking open your homes you get them open and you bring in the saints and you bring in unbelieving neighbors and friends and I open up my home as the transition of bringing people into the kingdom of God. The true grace of God, let your doors open up the way God has opened up your heart. And then he says, use your spiritual gifts. The true grace of God is I'm gonna take what you have put as a grace gift in me and by your spirit, I am gonna use it to serve the body of Christ for the building up. So if you want to say, what is the true grace of God? I am taking my spiritual gifts and I'm using them for the good of the body of Christ. I'm not going to sit on them. I'm not going to dig and put them in some hole. I'm going to use them. True grace of God to help build up the body of Christ. The true grace of God in chapter 4, verses 12 through 19 is you're going to suffer for the name of Christ. <laughs> in verse 19, therefore those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And so I just, I give myself to the God who's using persecution and everything to shape and mold me. I quit fighting and trying to do it myself and work things out. I entrust my soul to a faithful creator in you doing what is right. So when they come at me to persecute me, the temptation is to quit doing what's right so they'll quit persecuting me. And he's saying, you go do what's right. By the grace of God, you go into this world and you live the way Jesus would live and you speak the way Jesus would speak at any cost. And you entrust your soul to a faithful creator as they start coming after you. We have to quit learning how to take the edges off so people will like us again. People love moral people. They hate Christians. And to get out there and go be that and do what is right. Quit hiding. We finally get to get persecuted. Thank you, Jesus, in America. Get out there and do what's right, and they're going to come after you now, and they're going to chew you up and spit you out. And in that is how God will use it, that they might glorify God on the day of their visitation as you receive it graciously and kindly and don't let go of Jesus and show them that your hope is in him and not the office's approval. Get out there. That's the grace of God. Do what's right and trust your soul to a faithful creator when they come after you. The true grace of God in chapter five is that you shepherd the flock of God with love and humility as you're waiting for the chief shepherd to come and bring this reward with him. Young men, the grace of God, he says, is to be subject to your elders. The grace of God is you coming under them to lead you and not be prideful and arrogant and fight. 
In verse six, the grace of God is he's, he's in verse five, he's opposed to the proud, but what does he give to the humble? He gives grace. He gives the very thing that we need, what we're all longing, what we'll never live this Christian life without his grace. And so that the, pride, the proudful one blocks up and damns the grace of God. And the humble one is the veins in which the grace of God flows. And verse six, the grace of God will humble you under his mighty hand. Allow yourselves the humiliations of life. There's a God who's gonna bring things to humble you so you'll quit being so prideful and dependent on your own hands, your own works, your own abilities, your smartness. It's just God loves you. And he's gonna bring humiliations because no one gets humble naturally and easily. It's supernatural and it takes the hand of God if he's ever gonna bring someone into humility that just says God is all and I love God and I love others is a picture of humility. And so that is how God is. Grace will bring humiliations. Grace is it says, cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you then. Uh, it, it brings anxiety when you look to your own hands and you gotta solve it and you're trying to figure out how to protect yourself in the future and all of these things. All it brings is anxiety. And the grace of God is he, he cares for you and he wants you to cast every concern. There's this sweet little place I'm learning as a Christian that God wants us to come into and it's just surrender. It's to believe what this Bible really says and to live in this hand of God under the mighty hand of God, trusting him, uh, entrusting yourself to him, believing, letting him do what he's doing. And, and it's just, I'm telling you, it's peace, it's sweet. It's where God is working every child to bring them to where they just trust him as a father who happens to be the sovereign of the universe and is working for your good. That's the sweet place that grace brings you. Grace will resist the devil who wants to devour you, devour your faith. And he says, stand firm in your faith. And 510, grace will restore you from whatever God's doing to humble and break you right now. It, there's a time where God's gonna restore you and he's gonna make you established and steadfast and firm again and stronger in your faith. The grace of God will restore you. And then in 511, the grace of God reigns over all. To him be dominion forever and ever Amen. This is the true grace of God. He is the sovereign one over everything. Everything bows and all worship is ascribed and given to this God, the God of grace. Give him all the praise and glory and honor. And so climb into the grace of God. Paul says in Romans 5, 2, in this grace we stand. And so what I want you to see, guys, for the last year and a half to two years, this is the true grace of God. I want you to lay hold of that if you walk away with anything else. What we have done in these two years is this is what God's calling us now to do. What is my response to five chapters of grace? What, what does he want from us? What, are, what should we do? How should we respond to Peter? And it's gonna be very simple. Stand firm in it. That's what God wants from us. This is the true grace. You need to study it, meditate on it, pray over it, understand it, have the spirit enlighten your mind to the height and the depth and the breadth and the length of love of God in Christ Jesus. Stand in it. Stand in it is what he is calling us to do. Suffering will abound. Trials are promised if necessary, according to God. The world will come after you. And they will take away your rights and your possessions. They will mistreat you. They will revile you. There is a devil roaring to scare you. All of this can cause you to run. And it can cause you to flee. And you can do it outright or you can do it kind of subconsciously. But it can cause you to go apostate. I'm not going to be this light because they, they put it out if I shine too brightly. It's, it, it was easier when I was an unbeliever. I didn't have all the stuff I'm facing now. I didn't have some God loving me and bringing afflictions and humiliations into my life. Child of God, Peter at the close, stand firm in the grace of God. Stand firm in your faith. This is the true grace of God. And Romans 14, Paul says, he can cause you to stand and stand you will. Stand in the grace of God. And so the winds and the pressures and the attacks will, will, will not knock us down eternally. He's able. 
The grace of God will cause us to stand in the grace of God. Stand firm in it. It's a command to us, and yet the grace of God, God, is going to make sure that you stand. So you're being commanded, and you're going to have to act, but there's an overarching God who's saying, I will make sure you stand. So every one of you should marvel here this morning that you're still standing. Some of you have been through some horrific things and you're still standing with a feeble faith that's still looking to Jesus Christ. Give God the glory and the praise. Stand you will. It's because of God and God alone. And there's been many who have gone away because they were not of us. And then when it all came and got too hot in the kitchen, Jesus was not worthy of it or worth it. And so if you are still holding to Christ, you should give him praise and honor and thanks this morning for this beautiful gift. So hear this one statement, and I'll close out. Grace does not cancel out the imperative. It isn't grace now that there's no imperative. Stand for a minute. Indicatives are truths, and that's all of grace, what God has done. But now we're being called to an imperative, so it doesn't cancel it, it establishes it. It gives us the ability to keep it in Him. So get this, you need to fight the fight of faith. You need to believe the gospel and trust it at any cost. Live out the reality of what God has done and what he's calling us to be in Peter. And this grace that we have been called into will cause us to live in such a way that people will glorify God on the day of their visitation because of our excellent life. And people will ask you then, what is the hope within you? You you will stand out. It's so beautiful. And so saints of God, I just close with asking you to stand in the grace of God. This is the true grace of God. Don't try to get out and find a grace that is easy. This is the true grace of God and God will empower you and he will conform and bring you to glory. Stand in this grace. Get into that sweet place of just resting in God and his hand and his work and what he's doing. Stay in that sweet place of entrusting your soul to a faithful creator and just keep doing what is right on this journey to our true home. So in closing, I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to save time. We got a video. So uh, next week, I'll kind of hit the last part, greet one another with a kiss of love. What a beautiful thing. If I could just summarize it, we're all in this grace together. We're a family. This, this is a family reunion for me every Sunday. It's like I haven't seen you guys for 10 years every Sunday. And it's like, oh, there they are. You know, just th- this affection because of what we have in Christ, this what's coming where our hope is set, it, just, it, it should break down every wall, every barrier, everything that divides this world. We should walk in here and there's just nothing between us because Christ broke down that dividing wall. And we just come in and we greet each other with hugs and whatever our manifestation of expression is. If it's a handshake, do it. Fist bump, kiss on the cheek. Just be appropriate, but express love because you, you love each other, don't you? I love what you are and who you're going to be and what we're going to do together forever. So just respect people who don't like being hugged. You got to learn who does and who doesn't and, and love on each other and care about it. I won't mention any names. That's my sanctification. <coughs> and then uh, in two weeks, next week is the conference. The following week, I'm going to just close out. Uh, you said this morning you're closing out, but I just, there's one last thing. There, there's a benediction that says, peace be to you all who are in Christ. And we're just gonna spend one Sunday looking at the beauty and the glory of, I think, one of the sweetest benedictions in the scriptures. And so we will come and, and pray that benediction over this body, that the, the fruit of Peter would be peace. And that's what I desire as a shepherd. I, I, I want to be a minister for your joy and that you will find this glorious peace by believing these truths and what it will do in your lives. And so we will pray that benediction over you uh, next week. So let's go to God and pray. And then we'll we'll see a report uh, from the trip to Kenya. Father, I come before you and I thank you for the beauties of Peter. God, I thank you that you could summarize all of it in one word, that this is the true grace of God. And so Father, we thank you. And we thank you that you've revealed this because in our natural minds, we would never think this is the true grace of God. We would have always run to a wrong answer as we see every cult runs to something you must do to get right with God. We just thank you. Uh, every, Every cult says if you do good enough, there'll be no trials, no pain or hurt. We just thank you that 
we have learned the true grace of God through your word by your spirit. And I pray now, God, that you would let every Christian in this room stand firm in the true grace of God. Let them not be moved away or shaken. God, any bruised reed that's hurting this morning, I pray comfort and establish and fix them in this true grace of God and let them stand and not wilt. God, thank you. That is your power that will do this. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.